Wow, that was a very nice introduction. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for everybody coming out. And thank you to the Flying Squirrel, to Rochester Indie Media, and Rochester Red and Black for hosting me here tonight. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, getting out of Texas is a little difficult sometimes because uh, there's a lot of distance to get to regions. So if I can get anywhere, people like Leslie and Teresa and Nate, uh, it really is super helpful. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about a, a quite a few things tonight, but mostly what I'm going to talk about is how we can build power ourselves as communities and as individuals, and that we don't need governments, we don't need corporations, and that we can begin slowly to do things ourselves. And I think it's revealed clearly in the stories I'm going to tell uh, that are stories about people just like yourselves, people like me. And I'm going to use my own personal narrative to tell this story, but, the re but I don't want you to walk away thinking, I did things that nobody could do, or these people did things that you can't or haven't done. Just think that it's all of us, and that we will, we will act when it's important for us to act. And that, um, that ex ordinary people are often compelled in extraordinary circumstances to do things. I think that's really important. And um, the reason I use my personal narrative is because that's the story I can tell the most. And, um, uh, I, and I want to use it to illustrate these larger ideas. And I hope that, I hope that they're inspiring to you. I hope that they, they, they have relevance to you. Um, and this, this talk is going to cover a few sections, a little bit of personal history so you can figure out. Because even though I think that we're born anarchists um, or born with the, these liberatory tendencies, that um, they're often beat out of us. And so I want to show a little personal journey. Um, then I'm going to move into some, some movement history, some political movement history that is not linear. It's just to get to a narrative where we get to common ground. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about surveillance and spying. And then I'm going to end it with um, talking about some, some ways that we might think differently about the way we engage in political struggles. So if y'all are willing to go down those roads with me, um, uh, we can do that. Y'all in? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's do it. So um, uh, my book, Black Flags and Windmills, um, uh, is out uh, right now, tw uh, $12 to $20 sliding scale. This helps me travel from town to town selling these books. Um, and these are a limited edition because this is the first edition that will be gone. Um, uh, after these are gone, this is it. And this is what the cover of the second edition looks like. And the second edition won't be, about, will be out until August on the ninth anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. So with that, please work, please work. Of course, this thing is not going to work now. I've been having a lot of trouble with my little uh, sticky thing. Forgive me for just one second. Let me see this. It's going to do its deal. There we go. The title of Black Flags and Windmills is a reference to the black flags that anarchists have carried. Uh, anarchists have carried black flags for over a hundred years. But I think it's important to note that we would burn them in a second because it's not the flag is just a representation. It doesn't tell the story of what we do and who we are as anarchists. And also as a reference to Don Quixote. How many people have read Don Quixote over the, over the years? Um, I have often felt like Don Quixote, and I think we as political movements have often engaged like Don Quixote, where there's times when we might have actually slayed real giants, but quite, quite often we really just tilt at windmills, and we don't even realize it. And uh, so it reminds me to be humble. It reminds me to check myself when I think that I'm right about everything. And like everybody, um, I, 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 you know, I, start, I grew up uh, in a small rural town outside of Dallas, Texas, um, uh, in, a, in a working poor community, uh, working poor community, and working poor family. Uh, but like a lot of us, I think I was born with some innate know, knowing of what was wrong and what was right. Um, I didn't have to tell tell anybody. When I saw friends of mine uh, uh, injuring animals or destroying the natural world, it hurt inside, and nobody had told me that it was going to hurt. Um, you know, I, you know how kids can be mean. Um, but what I'm, um, but I often rebelled against things. When I look around the world, I could see that things were different. That what was on TV, the families I saw, were often different than mine. Why was it that my dad went to prison, my uncles went to prison, my cousins were in prison? How, was I going to end up in prison? These are things I was thinking as a kid and as a teenager. And. Um, and, but I didn't have any political understanding of it. And then the only, only thing I knew about politics was that you had to vote. And if you voted, things changed. But when I saw those people on TV, I was like, who are these people? I have no idea who they are. And, um, and then I started to, started to figure things out. And I quit high school when I was, um, when I was uh, a senior in high school. I was going to be the first person in my family to graduate from high school. And this is like my extended family. And in agreement for quitting high school, I agreed to go to college for a few months. And that was the first time I tasted the idea of collective power in the streets. When I got in the streets, and here, here I was in 1985 rocking a mullet at, uh, at my first demonstration. Um, it was the 80s, and it was new wave. Um, 
But, um, but that was the first time I saw people like us resisting oppression, resisting power, and saying, ya basta, enough. And even though I didn't have a deep political understanding, I loved it. I felt the energy, the excitement. And I was like, we can do other things. And so I started to move forward. But as, as we go, like over the years, I started to gain more and more information about things. And I started to work on some core issues that I've carried with me for a long time. One of those is animal liberation. Um, I don't want vegan consumerism, what I've realized after 25 years, is I want animal liberation. I don't want exploitation of, of non-human animals in any form. And that doesn't matter I, whether you eat meat or not is not, the, is not the thing. I don't want exploitation of animals, whether it's factory farms, circuses, sea world, any of that. Exploitation. And I don't want the destruction of the natural world, which is also tied in this. Um, for over 20 years, I've worked in different ways through liberal means and non-liberal means to, to save the natural world. And the last thing was political prisoners and prison issues. I've worked on prison issues since 1985 and political prisoners because they touched my life. And at first I thought political prisoners were only th people that were far away, Steve Biko, uh, Nelson Mandela, people like that. But then I re started to learn over the decades that there was, we had them here. And so that's how, uh, these are three issues that have kind of come through my whole life. And in the late, in the mid 90s, uh, early to mid 90s, I was introduced to former members of the Black Panther Party and started to learn about the Black Panther Party. At first I just thought they hated Whitey. Anybody else ever think that? And, uh, and so the Black Panther Party uh, brought two key concepts to me from talking to these uh, brothers and sisters who had been members of it. You know, this is the 90s, I'm a young white kid, um, and I don't understand that much. And I say young, I was probably in my 20s already by that time. But they had two ideas. One was the idea of self-defense, that communities have a right to defend themselves by any means necessary. The second thing that they had were survival programs pending revolution, that, that not that that solving issues are way more complicated than we want and that we can't just take up guns and do things, that we must help people meet their material needs. And that was, for them, it, was a, it made questions complex. If somebody was hungry, we could do one, one easy thing, which is what? To feed them, right? But the Panthers asked the question, why are they hungry? And what they did was they said, if they're, are they hungry because they, they, don't have, uh, they have poor health? So maybe we should build some free clinics so they can get access to good health. Is it, is, are they hungry because they don't have access to good jobs because they don't have access to education? Maybe we should build some free schools for the youngsters and start building them up. And then they can get good jobs with decent education. Things like this. They looked at things much more complicated and integrated. Of course, the Panthers go, were gone by that time. But the other concept that I got introduced to... Uh, were these um, indigenous people that rose up in Chiapas, Mexico. Uh, very poor, very forgotten people called the Zapatistas. How many people know about the Zapatistas? The Zapatistas took very similar models that the Black Panther Party had used 25 years before. The same ideas of, of self-determination, the same ideas of, 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 of building, uh, of, of actually trying to build, rebuild infrastructure themselves, of healthcare, education, these basic foundations of civil society. But what they dropped was the hierarchy. The Black, Black Panthers weren't known for power sharing, uh, uh, especially in the Central Committee. They had a very strict hierarchy, and, for their, and, 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 and often, I would argue, for their sexism. And the, the Zapatistas said, we're not going to do that. We are going to work as equals. We're going to do these things. But they also got rid of the hierarchy because they realized that each and every one of our voices count, and that we should listen to each other to collectively make decisions about our futures. And the second thing that they did that I think is really, really important was that instead of the, the old communist or socialist idea of if you follow the scientific socialist formula that we will have revolution and then we will be free, they said that, they, they, they rejected that and they said we will have postmodern revolutions, that we will have living revolutions, I, revolutions that will look different as we move and that we will be flexible in. And those are very powerful concepts. Now, you have to remember that in the, in the time frame of all this, that in the, in the left, uh, the communists dominated, big C communists and big S communists. And some of y'all may have been part of parties or, or been part of, of, part of pulling that line. But what has started to happen in the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union was they started to lose their grip in the United States. And they really pretty much dominated. If anybody's ever organized with them, I mean, like, I, I was in those organizations, I, not as a leader, but as somebody who got told what to do a lot. And... Um, they, when they started to lose their grip, these ideas were really powerful, these root ideas that we can collectively make decisions together. The, the, and so in the late 90s, I was reintroduced to the ideas of anarchy. And the organizer who actually started to really talk to me was a longtime Wobbly organizer, an IWW organizer. 
and he had done prison time in Angola, Louisiana, uh, back in the 60s for drugs. But he actually showed me what, the, uh, he really introduced to me the ideas of anarcho-communism. And that really came, and it really felt like I'd come home when I came to that. And um, I think that um, it really started to make sense. I felt like I didn't have to wait for somebody else to do something, and I didn't have to listen to somebody else to do it. We could just do it ourselves. And, and you know, anarchy looks uh, a lot of different ways to a lot of different people. Uh, but some of the basic ideas that I think that are really core that, that, that really resonated with me are the ideas that it's anti-capitalist, that we do not want a kind of gentler capitalism of any kind, that we don't need any economic structures that, that dominate our lives. And the ideas of mutual aid, um, that we work better when we work together on things, and that my, my struggles are tied up in your struggles together and making our worlds better. The ideas of... Um, of autonomy though, that we don't all have to do everything together, that I as an individual can be in autonomous and we as communities can be autonomous from each other even if we have the same ideas. So that way it doesn't say that uh, different than socialism or communism which says we're all in this, we're all going to do this together or not, anarchy proposes that I may be autonomous or our communities may be autonomous. And the ideas of liberation, that we don't want just economic liberation, we want social, cultural, political liberation. No hierarchies, no authority of any kind. Um, and that this liberation is collective. That my, I want my own individual liberation, but I want liberation for, I want y'all to want liberation yourselves. The ideas of solidarity, the ideas that that those of us who have access to resources, like I live in North America, I have access to resources that maybe we could help support communities uh, in, in the global south or in other places that need it, that we are tied together. That again, it, it's, a, it's about tying ourselves together. But the last one that, that really resonated me, with me was the idea of direct action. That we have the power to bring ourselves into conflict with the state, and that's an important thing. And that we do not have to wait on party leaders, we do not have to wait for people who are voters, we don't have to wait on any of that, that we can take action. If we see problems, that we begin to take action to ourselves. And that really resonated with me because I was tired of waiting on committees to tell us what to do, or seeing that, they, that we can only do these things in this way, that we could do things differently. And for me, it was largely in the animal liberation movements and through the radical environmental movements that I saw this in action, through tree sets, through um, anti-fur campaigns that I worked on in the, in the 90s and stuff, and then the alternative globalization movement in the middle. But all three of these disparate tendencies I've just mentioned have some overarching themes that I think that, that are really important to draw out. And one of them is the idea of autonomy and self-determination that I talked about. I think it's really important that we have that all communities and we as individuals have the right to determine our own futures. The next one is the ideas of dual power. And for me, the interpretation of dual power that I'm talking about is that we resist exploitation and oppression on one hand, but we must also create and build on the other hand. We can, one without the other, is they're, 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 it's no good. We need both of them. And, the idea, and both of the, all of these tendencies talk about those ideas. The ideas of participatory democracy or power sharing. The ideas that each of our voices matter in making decisions. That each of us needs to talk about our collective futures and that we need to determine those together. And the ideas that communities have a right to defend themselves. Self-defense. Whatever that means. It's not necessarily always arms. It can be legal means or whatever. But nobody has a right to steal water from your, your town. Nobody has a right to... Uh, to, to uh, to, and to tread on you in any way, that we have a right to defend ourselves. And the ideas of language and narrative that tell stories of building something beyond ourselves, that are talking about these beautiful things. Anarchists are, are often uh, derided for being romantic. If that's, if that's a problem, I love that. It's a problem I, I can live with. Because I want, to dream, I want to tell stories, I want us to tell stories of bigger futures, of greater futures that we could all be a part of. Because I think in our movements so often we don't. And these tendencies, I think, have all brought that together. And the ideas of connecting the struggles, it's really important that th these tendencies actually drew connections between prisons and animal liberation and, and uh, environmental issues and immigration issues and really that, that think about connecting the struggles. So anarchy was still, um, in the, in, uh, up until the 90s, was still kind of the, the, uh, the step kid until the alternative globalization movement happened. And after the alternative globalization movement rose up uh, and, and, and it had its coming out party in Seattle in 1999 at the World Trade Organization, how many people remember that? 
you know about that. I wasn't there, but I, I was so inspired by it. Uh, I was part of a co-op at the time. I immediately was like, I'm leaving this co-op. I'm going to go back to organizing full time. This is what I'm doing. And the alternative globalization movement was really interesting because it was, a, it was a movement of movements in the United States, not built on national identity of a state. Um, where, where people, we could support farmers in India, we could, or the landless peasants in, um, in Brazil, um, or workers in, in, uh, in Korea, and we could work together as individuals or as groups. We didn't have to work as a, one group working with this nation state. And we were tearing down the undemocratic institutions on one hand, but on the other hand, we were building this movement of movements that was incredibly beautiful. And the, and, and the, way it, the, the way we engaged it largely in the United States and in, in parts of Europe and in Canada was we had these mass summits, huge summits where tens of thousands of people would show up like they did in Seattle. And it could be all these disparate voices talking about things. And we were tearing down, the, like I said, the undemocratic institutions, but building them. And I think it's really important. And this is the outward part that's happening. But everybody would gather for, for, for days or weeks to, beforehand to make things happen. And then behind the scenes, we were having convergence centers. We were practicing participatory democracy through consensus, general assemblies, affinity groups. But we were also forming these informal networks, things like street medics, uh, which were made up of, of people who were EMTs, paramedics, doctors, RNs, um, uh, uh, naturopathic doctors, massage people, anybody who could take care of people. And we were also forming legal networks where we had uh, uh, paralegals and real legal teams who would come and take care of people there. And these started to form these informal networks. And also Food Nut Bombs. How about, has anybody participate with Food Nut Bombs? Which has been around, thank you all for doing that. Which has been around for a long time. But Food Nut Bombs would come in and feed thousands of people. And we got to have these moments of having autonomous zones that we felt like we were powerful and in control. And like every move, uh, all, 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 all things, they, must, they, they collapse at some point. Um, and um, I'm going to back up for just one second. And, um, and you know, I mean, they flew, two, buildings, they flew two, two planes into the buildings in New York, and that started to change everything. It wasn't over. The alternative globalization movement wasn't over, but it started to change things. But these networks were really, really meant something to me. And I kept thinking, what are these things like? And what could we do with these things? And how can we connect these things? Because these are really powerful networks that we're building. And again, anarchy wants to organize out of these decentralized sets of things where there's no central control over it, these nodes. And we had these in play, and now the summits weren't happening. And we moved forward a little bit, and the storm came ashore called Hurricane Katrina. And people remember Hurricane Katrina? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I talk to a lot of young people um, who are maybe in their teens or 20s. And so I think when, you know, when I ask that question, it's not, uh, it's not hyperbolic. I want people to, to know because some people were 13, 14 years old when that happened, or 11 years old or 20. And, uh, but I want to say there's three things, there's three really, really key pieces that you should remember about Hurricane Katrina. And it's a man-made disaster. People know that, right? And the way it's a man-made disaster was one, climate change. Absolutely climate change. Uh, if we weren't uh, doing what we were doing to live on this planet, uh, storms would not be as powerful as they are. And they're getting to be more powerful. The second part that's in that, uh, that's part A of number one. Part B of that is that in the Gulf Coast, all along here, they've been digging out. The Gulf Coast is huge. This is, um, besides Mexico, it's the States. But all throughout here, there's oil wells and oil derricks. And so what they've been doing is dredging up the sandbars that are the natural barriers so that they can dig further and further down. And they're digging them closer and closer to the shoreline. The other thing is that the Mississippi River, which travels uh, uh, north and south, they've widened the Mississippi River so they can move bullshit up and down the, the Mississippi River. And that's a technical term. <laughs> and, um, and so that's allowed, so all of this has allowed storms to move further up. Into, into land, inland than they are. Bigger storms can move further in. The second thing is, it's the, it's the levee failure that caused the disaster. And um, the levee failure, I think, is really important to think about because um, instead of what governments supposedly are supposed to do, which is to protect the people, I mean, we know that there's a contradiction about the state, but let's pretend for a second they, they, they didn't do their job, which was to protect people by building these levees. So instead of you know, some politician got $2 billion to build levees. Instead of building the levees, they spent $1.65 building some chicken wire and, and making it look like it was good. And then the levees failed, of course, right? And then the third thing, which is the most important thing, is the reaction uh, of the government right after the storm. 
Um, because the government, instead of trying to figure out how to get people out who could not evacuate from one of the poorest areas in the whole United States, decided to restore law and order. And all of that, I'm going to tell you, was criminal neglect. I cannot say it any nicer. It was criminal neglect what they did to the people in New Orleans and in the Gulf Coast region. And the fact that nobody has gone on trial for it and the law and justice of, of, of the United States is criminal. And, and, you know, New Orleans is historically a very poor area. And the Gulf Coast in that area is very poor. And there's about 100,000 people, plus or minus, who were left to, to, to die, basically. They could not get out of there because either economic reasons they had no place to go they had no transportation to get out and and so in the evacuations they had no plans to help people evacuate who were in those situations this is elderly people and children and families this is not just uh, hardened criminals because they're poor and they're black and the government instead of saying hey we're gonna do anything we can to get you out um, before or after the storm they said you're black you're poor you're a criminal and if you, sh if you take food or water or anything from stores, we're going to shoot you. Orders were, were shoot to kill for looters. So I told you I've been working on political prisoner issues for a long time. And so one, of the, one of the people, some of the people I've supported the longest have been the Angola Three. Have you all heard about the Angola Three? Anybody raise a hand? Uh, three longest held people in solitary confinement in modern U.S. history. These three men uh, separately have uh, served over... 30 years in, in, in rooms that are probably no bigger than most people's bathrooms, six by nine cells. Um, the man on the left, who has gone on to the ancestors now, is Herman Wallace. He was released last fall and died two days later. This man was a good man. I loved Herman. I used to visit him in prison a lot. He served 46 years in solitary confinement for being a member of the Black Panther Party. The state killed him. The man on the right is Albert Wood Fox. He is now the longest held person in solitary confinement in modern U.S. history at 47 years, and we're working to get him free, and we're going to get him out. The man in the middle is Robert King. And King won his just freedom after 29 years in solitary confinement in 2001, and we became fast friends. I've been a supporter of his for a long time since then. After he got out of, New, after he got out of prison, he moved back to New Orleans, where he was from. And when the storm came ashore, he was, uh, I believed he was trapped there. And so a man, uh, a man named Brandon Darby called me and said, hey, uh, let's go get, uh, let's go get uh, Robert King, and let's do search and rescue along the way. So the storm comes ashore on Sunday. On Monday, the levees fail. On Monday afternoon, martial law is declared in the United States. It's a disaster area. And I could already see the failure of the government. And I am eight hours away in Austin, Texas. And I did not want this man to die because he had fought for so much justice and so much behind prison bars. I didn't want him to drown. And I thought that we could do something to try to help him. So we took off. I was there on Wednesday. And uh, all it took were, we, we took two guns, food, water, and a boat. And we were going to try to get into the flooded areas of New Orleans. And we didn't know exactly what that meant. Neither one of us had boat experience. Uh, and we didn't know exactly what it was going to be like. And so we took a, we, we ended up uh, through a series of things, trying to, we doing search and rescue, helping people, uh, dragging our boat around, doing all these things. And there's nobody there. There's no military. There's barely any police. There's nobody helping people. And I can see families on the rooftops. I know they're stuck in the attics of their houses and nobody is there to help them except for people just like you and like me who are showing up with boats and anything said we'll do anything we can to help you and the government is trying at all levels is trying to stop us so we 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 thwarted them by going to the to the open ocean of the gulf coast into a storm with an overloaded boat which was totally stupid but we were desperate to get there and this is what i saw this is the intercoastal canal that we were going to come in this is one of the levees right here 
And this is an area that you know now that you never heard of before Hurricane Katrina called the Lower Ninth Ward. And we're going to come in. This barge is supposed to be over here. And this is supposed to, there's a wall here that's like 20 feet tall. This is about 10 to 27 feet deep. And we were going to get into the area. But we started to hear story after story about white rescuers being shot by people who were desperate because they were left to die. And, I, and think about this. I think it's really important to think about. People were able to get up into their attics because they have you know, the, the, roof, the, roof, uh, the roof access. They're coming up as the water is rising. Then they get trapped in there. Some of them could bust through and get up on the rooftops, but a lot of families couldn't. A lot of individuals couldn't. And it's 100 degrees outside. So it's 140, 130 degrees in people's attics. And nobody is doing anything to help them except for people like us. But I didn't want to kill anybody. I didn't want to shoot anybody. I didn't want to be shot by anybody trying to help anybody. But I want you to pay attention to this house. See this house right here? You're going to see that house again later. So with a lot of shame, after a few days, um, we got there on Wednesday. After, on Saturday, we decided to turn around and come back because they were starting to call for search and rescue. There was more and more reports of people being shot, which now we know was, were, was bullshit, but we didn't know that at the time. And so we only could make the decisions that we could make based on the information that we had. And I can tell you, I had so much shame leaving. I, in any action I had ever engaged in, in political action, I never left anybody. If somebody was going to get arrested, we all stayed there until, until, and we all got arrested. You never leave anybody behind. And here I was leaving tens of thousands of people, not just in a political action, to die. Even if I couldn't help them. Even, I wasn't a savior. I was going to try to do what I could do. But we were going to leave them to die. I felt a lot of shame. We've taken a lot of privilege, a lot of, a lot of resources to get there. And now we're just leaving. So I got home on Sunday. Uh, and I got another call from this man named Malik Rahim. He was another former member of the Black Panther Party. He had been childhood friends with Robert King, uh, had been a, a member of the Panthers with King. They'd known each other all, all their lives. And he, had, in his, he lived in Algiers, which is just south of the river. And he had heard we were there looking for King, and he needed some support. He said, we got white militias driving around, and they're going to kill me. He lives in a largely black area, about a population of about 70,000, uh, about 20 square miles. There's about eight blocks that is uh, white and wealthy, uh, with a little poor white outline around it. Eight blocks. And they had, uh, they had all gotten together, um, and they got started driving around these trucks, just like the Ku Klux Klan, and they were going to met out justice the way they, they saw fit. And that what they were doing is they were threatening and killing um, young black men who they found to be threatening. And they were threatening Malik because they didn't like him because he was kind of popular. He had been organizing in those communities for a long time. And so they drive by and they aim their guns at him as they go by and they're like, we're going to get you, mayor. They called him the mayor of Algiers. We're going to get you. And so Malik was afraid for his life. And so he said, we need some support. And what he meant was like, I need you to bring guns and we need help. And so I came to a group of people who I practiced self-defense with, armed self-defense. I'm a gun owner. And I, I trained with people in anti-racist action to actually defend ourselves and our communities. And I came to these people and a bunch of other people, and nobody would come back to New Orleans with me except for Brandon Darby. And so Monday, I'm back in New Orleans again. And so we're going to get King, and we're going to see what happened. So we end up in an armed standoff with the militia in front of Malik's house. They're drunk and making threats, and we're stone cold sober on the porch of Malik's house. It's something I've carried with me because I, we all had our guns trained on them and I could have unloaded, I think in my gun at the time I had a 30, 30, uh, 30 round capacity and we could have unloaded between the five of us, two white guys and three guys from the neighborhood, um, probably 200 rounds in them and we weren't drunk. Now, had I killed those men that day or shot or injured those men because they were just racist assholes, I would be carrying that with me today. I still carry it with me even though I didn't do it. I didn't pull the trigger. But it, but it was one of the proudest things I ever did, but also one of the most complicated and, uh, things and one of the, something I have definitely thought about over and over again. So when we come back after we had done that, this is the first thing that we saw. We saw the criminalization of black people who were taking food and water and uh, whatever, whatever else was left. 
Remember this, these people were left to die. So who cares if they break into a store and take food and water and cigarettes and liquor? And if you know what, if they want to break into Walmart and take DVDs and TVs, go for it, man. You are left to die. You can have it all. There's no electricity, and if you want to carry a TV, you know, a mile down the road and eight feet of water, go to town on it, man. And it's just property. They should not be criminalized for it. But this is what was happening. The second thing I saw was a huge military buildup. And the military was coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And I felt sorry for them because a lot of these people as first responders were coming back to their own communities and seeing their, their lives destroyed. And they were, but they weren't helping people. People were still, uh, almost 10 days into it, people were still trapped on the rooftops, still trapped in their attics, still trapped on their porches to die. Nobody was feeding them. Nobody was giving them water or basic medical attention. And so when I got, when it, and, and Malik's one of the first things that we did was um, I'd already seen drowned bodies. I'd already seen drowned animals by thousands of them by then and, and drowned humans. And it was traumatizing. And then at Malik's, one of the first things that we did was we found this man who is a bullet riddled dead body. And he's laying there in the open with no shirt on and bullets. Who killed this man? Was it the militia? Or was, it the, or was it the NOPD, the New Orleans Police Department? To this day, I still don't know. But the only thing that we could do at that point was to cover him up with the, with the metal. And they put the X on him later, uh, a couple of days later. That man laid there for 16 days. And he was one of two dead bullet riddled bodies in the neighborhood. How you doing? Welcome. And so this is the severity of the situation. I want to tell you that everything that you think you know about civil society was gone. Everything that you think of that holds whatever the world together was gone. So where any story I'm telling you was out of context for anything. And the, the amount of disaster was unimaginable. I promise you, you cannot even imagine it. Even all the stories I tell you, you cannot imagine it. But out of all of this travesty, all of this confrontation, we had started the self-defense caucus. And then we started to ask people... Um, what we should do. I had been thinking back and forth. I'd gone back and forth to New Orleans three times in, in about, about 15 days. And I kept thinking, what would somebody, what would groups like the Black Panther Party do? Survival programs pending revolution. What would the Zapatistas do? They would build autonomous communities. They would, they would, they would defend themselves. And what would I do as an anarchist? If I, don't, if I do not trust the government and I think that we can do it for ourselves, well, why don't we do it for ourselves? And so I started to formulate this plan. And I pitched it to Malik Rahim, which is this man right here, who's given his life to community organizing since he was a former member, since he was a member of the Black Panther Party in 1971. This man ended up in an armed standoff with the police in 1971 in New Orleans and survived it. He'd served prison time. He was a housing rights activist. He had done a lot of things. And so I pitched it to him and he said it was great. And then I talked to this woman, Sharon Johnson, who was, who was also there. And she had never organized anything in her life, but she was an incredible organizer uh, in what we ended up doing. She had been an, uh, an accountant in an office before this, and never organized anything in her life, did not know where her family was because everybody was scattered throughout in the diaspora. And then my old mutton head self, we all came together and we, and we formed this organization and we called it the Common Ground Collective. And the ideas were really simple and basic. The ideas of solidarity, not charity. That we would come into communities not to help, just help them, but to help build them back up in their own image, in their own way. And it was two, temp two simple concepts in that. One is to build infrastructure that had never existed in these communities. And to, or two was to rebuild infrastructure that had collapsed uh, due to, to the long, slow history of disaster and then the, and that was exacerbated by Katrina. Healthcare, education, schooling, I mean all of these little things that we could do. And the first thing that we did when, I, when we proposed this political question to me was so powerful. We gathered the, commu um, the community of, of people in, in Malik's neighborhood, which is about, about 20 or 30 people at the time. And we, and we had been thinking about these ideas, and I was like, what are we going to do? And, and, and we were going we to take the ideas from the, the Zapatistas to lead by obeying, which is to ask them what they needed. And so I thought it was going to be complicated. I thought they were going to, when we asked this question, I thought it was going to be something that was so difficult that we couldn't even do it, and we were going to shrivel immediately. And I asked the question, what do you guys need? And you know what they said? This woman spoke up, and she said, can you get the rotting trash out of the streets and down the street? And that was it. 
and, and, and I, was, I was free. I was like, that's it? That's how we start? And so that's what we did. We started picking up trash and moving it out of the way. And then we started to build an organization. And the idea was to build it on anarchist ideas and principles of power sharing, consensus decision making, um, to make it as networks, to, to, um, to use affinity group models, to, to, you know, to defend our community, all of these things without the government. We were going to do these projects with or without government interference or assistance. Red Cross, they, they, they were the enemy to us. And, um, and, and we started to tell these stories of imagination, these stories of building revolution in New Orleans, of not our revolution, not a white organization, but their revolution, to be able to change people's lives, to actually help them build their political power from below. And it was very simple. Because if we could get somebody to get a leg up, to get their health back in order, to get stability, food security of community gardens, simple things like this, then they can figure out what they want. And we went into each community and we'd ask them, what is it that you need? What is it we can do to help you build your political power? Or what is it we can do to help you build your lives, to rebuild your lives? And, and, we, and every community was different. Some it was health care, some it was education, some it was community defense. And, and then we started building programs. And we started with really simple stuff. And, and it, this amazing thing happened. From the three of us, there was five, and then there was 10, and then there was 50, and then there was thousands of people just like yourselves who saw that they, they could take a chance to do something. And there's this thing that's inside of us that I think is incredibly beautiful that I, I want to talk about, and it's called our emergency heart. And it's this beautiful thing that pumps inside of us that we never even think about. It's the thing that drives our passion. It's what drives our compassion for, for ourselves and for the natural world. And everybody's emergency hearts were kicking in because it was the right time to do it. And all of a sudden, we started to tell these stories of building revolution, and thousands and thousands of people started to come. Even though we didn't have any master plan about what we were going to do. And we started to build this organization that worked as an organization and as a network. And it was just simple things. Food and water distribution. Um, building health clinics in, in, in different areas. We didn't build one clinic or one distribution center. We built, well, distribution centers, we built 50 or 60 of them. Health clinics, we built seven of them, and we had mobile clinics. In fact, actually, one of the sisters here I talked to earlier was one of the people who helped us with the mobile clinics. And, um, uh, and, then, and then we also provided legal defense for communities. Uh, simple things like that. And, and it was just we built program and project after program and project. Um, and it was like cleaning up garbage, uh, you know, like service work, but with a political alliance to it. But also, at the same time, many of us were carrying guns because we still had, the, the, even though the white militia was receding, we still had the police to deal with, and the police were out of control. And I'm going to tell you this. In those first few weeks, I thought I was going to die after I got there. I actually thought I was going to get killed in the middle of the street by the police. Not once, not twice, three times, four times. But I was willing to die for what I believed in. And there was people just like you who were there who said, we will die for this if that's what's going to happen. And we were willing to give our lives to people we didn't even know. And that was liberating. To, to ways I can't even talk about, that I haven't even been able to process. And after, uh, on, on, the, on the occasions when, when I thought the police were going to kill me were not abstracts. It was where they put their guns to my head and said they were going to blow my fucking brains out. And the, the third time it happened, something clicked. And I was, I was on my knees, and he was waving his gun at the 17-year-old. I was like, leave him alone. And, I, and he said, and he put his gun to the side of my head. And he started pushing my head. And I'm, like, I'm gonna shoot you, motherfucker. And I said, go ahead and shoot me. Just do it. Stop talking about it. And just do it. It was very traumatizing, but I was willing to die at that point. And but but then after that, I had freedom because I wasn't afraid of them at all. And many of us weren't afraid. And we kept building these programs, and we started building networks, and we kept building more and more. We started working with communities in the Gulf Coast. We started working with the Cajun communities, the Creole communities, Vietnamese communities, the Homa Nation, which is made up of about 50 bands and tribes of First Nations people along the coast. And the thing is, we, didn't, we weren't saviors. We came in to give them support to build the world that they wanted to build. And, and some of it was working out fine, and some of it wasn't. And one of the things that, common, that made Common Ground different 
was that I took all these ideas that we had drawn from the alternative globalization movement, from the anarchist movement. Remember I was talking about the street medics? Remember I was talking about the legal defense teams, food up bombs? Those are the networks we were able to draw from, these informal networks. We were able to call them in and that's how we were able to build these things. We were building on what had been built before. Not just ideas, but the practical things. We were able to build capacity. And the other thing was that we worked in dual power. We didn't want to just resist oppression and exploitation. We wanted to offer alternatives and to create at the same time. And we did it under one giant umbrella that or operated as an organization and as a network. But the other thing was that we were able to resist. When we were talking about resist, a lot of people who came were largely white, largely young, people with privilege of different, of different kinds, but they were willing to put their bodies on the line to stop the machine, to stop the dis destruction, to stop whatever was going on, including uh, police brutality. And one of the things that uh, some Common Ground volunteers started to do was to occupy places. And so um, this house was in the Lower Ninth Ward, um, and so Common Ground volunteers would break the law for, for the higher moral law. You know, for anybody who doesn't, doesn't think about this, all laws are bureaucratic, arbitrary, and selectively enforced, and they're reactionary. And so if, if Homeland Security said, barricaded in an area where there's people, and they said, you can't be there, Common Ground volunteers went under the barricades to feed them, to house them, to do whatever it was to take care of them. And they also occupied buildings. And so in the Lower Ninth Ward, this woman, Doris Cager, had seen us on the news in the early weeks. And uh, by December, she called, and she had said, hey, I have this house, I want you to build a distribution center out of it because my community needs it, even though she wasn't there. And so Common Ground volunteers occupied the building. They were arrested by Homeland Security the next morning. More Common Ground volunteers came in, were arrested again, a third set came in, and they didn't leave. And then it became a distribution center. And that became a model that we used over and over again in each of the communities that, where they wouldn't allow us. The other thing that we did was that we appropriated materials from the state. So um, they had these archaic things. Um, Y'all have counties here, right? Mm -hmm. So they have parishes, very similar. So if FEMA had a, a warehouse in this parish over here, and the warehouse was full of food and water, and there's only 10 people here, those are the only people that could ex access that. Even though there's a parish right here 10 blocks away in another parish, another warehouse, that's empty, and there's thousands of people here that need it, you could not bring it over. So what we did was we manufactured badges, we went in, would empty out the warehouse as best as we could, and we'd come over and we'd feed the people. <laughs> The other thing that, that was happening was that people were being evicted from their homes. I'm going to tell you another one. I'll tell you the, the home thing in a second. The other thing we did was we appropriated gasoline. We manufactured bus, uh, badges because there was no gasoline. There's no gas stations and stuff. So we, we siphoned gas from cars and trucks that were on the road, which had a lot of water in it. But the military and FEMA and all these places had, had, um, had gas. And so what we did is we used our, our badges that we found and we, um, we would get in line with them. So there'd be all these military trucks and then our hippie vehicles in line, and we'd get free gasoline from them uh, over and over again. But in the housing thing, you have to understand, New Orleans is one of those historical places in the United States where there's intergenerational housing. Houses, houses are passed down from generation to generation to generation for hundreds of years. I have friends who have, have family who have lived there for hundreds of years, which is rare in the United States. But they're not passing down deeds. They're not passing down, uh, you know. They're not passing. They're not having house. In, they're not having home insurance and things like that because somebody's mama gave it to somebody's mama to their uncle to their cousin, and then the house is on on down. So there's that. But also, housing was historically really cheap in New Orleans. Like you could rent a whole house for two hundred dollars, pretty regularly. Like you could find it in a lot of areas. And all of a sudden, all these uh, uh, corporate. Um, disaster response companies started coming in, KBR, Halliburton, people like that, and all of a sudden, overnight rents were $1,200, $1,500. And it's, so one, then they started kicking people out of their houses. So what did, what did Common Ground do? We started eviction defense teams. So whenever they kicked people out of their houses, we unevicted them and moved their stuff back in. And then, if they didn't have electricity, and we could figure it out, we, we set up electricity once there was electricity in certain parts of the neighborhood. And we just kept doing it over and over again, on one hand resisting it, but on the other hand, other people were working on legal strategies to stop it. And then um, later, uh, when they started to tear down public housing, Common Ground volunteers were, the, were putting their bodies on the line in the lead uh, uh, because they could take the risk to stop public housing from being cut down. 
And then one of the, the, one of the stories I'm the most happy about was that there was a school, uh, a public school that wanted to reopen in 2006 and the, the board of trustees, the principal actually wanted to open it back up. And um, the, princ uh, the board of trustees said, this school cannot be opened, it'll cost $3 million, you can't do it, uh, we're not gonna do it. And so uh, this, t this principal, Doris Hicks, said, no, I really want this school to be open. Common ground volunteers took their privilege, broke the law, walked up, cut the locks off the door, and walked in and started cleaning it out. And then the students came in and started cleaning it out. And the school is now an exemplary school. Now, Common Ground didn't build the school. We, we just were willing to take, take those risks because we could. And, and people weren't doing it with a savior mentality. They were doing it because they could take those risks because, because they, weren't, they weren't gonna be targeted as much as the people who lived there. And I think that's an important distinction to make. But, you know, building revolution is not, always, it's not always beautiful. In fact, it's actually a beautiful train wreck is what it is. It's like we were going down the, the tracks, you know, 175 miles an hour, faster and faster and faster, almost careening off the tracks over and over again. And every once in a while, everything would just collapse on the side and all the cars would come crashing in. That's what it was like. And we'd pick the cars back up, the train would start to take off again. It was hard, dirty work. It was crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis, externally and internally. Because we could never be anarchist enough for many anarchists. We were um, too liberal for other people. We were too radical for other people. There was so, so, so many times that people were gonna complain about the things that we were doing while we're in the middle of a crisis, instead of just doing it and letting it be what it is. And one of the things I've learned from that is that revolutions always look better in the rear view mirror. And uh, so we told these stories of revolution, thousands of people came. In the first three years, 38,000 people just like yourselves came. From that first $50 that we raised, we raised over $3 million in the first three years of the organization. And nobody got paid. There was no administrative costs, no administrative fees. It was like people with their emergency hearts pumping, paying $10, $20, $30 to make it happen. And they saw what we were doing. And nobody could tell us what to do with the money. We did what we wanted to do with the money. And even people like Bruce Springsteen, um, uh, Danny Glover, uh, Sean Penn, Susan Sarandon, between them they gave us probably $400,000 and they couldn't tell us what to do with the money either. Nobody could tell us what to do with the money. We were going to do with it what we want or we were going to blow it how we were going to blow it. Um, and so with just the basic ideas of direct action, mutual aid, good community organizing and a lot of outreach, we, we helped build neighborhood assemblies, communication centers. We built some of the first communication centers in the, in, in the whole region off of uh, open source networks on one uh, basically off of one Wi-Fi card, we were able to network multiple computer centers because we had these hackers come in who knew what they were doing and building it. And one of them was a guy named Jacob Applebaum who went on to work with Tor. So if anybody who pays attention to that stuff, he's a, he's, he, I uh, help him a lot. We also help walk people through um, the, the process. Uh, you know, the Red Cross and FEMA, they wanted everybody to sign up online for everything. Well, these are historically neglected communities where a lot of people didn't have computers or they were elderly, they'd just never seen them. So how are they gonna get through this process to even get things? So we help people to walk through those. Uh, we built health clinics, multiple health clinics. We built seven health clinics, uh, we had mobile clinics, and then today, two clinics still exist. Uh, we built legal support, eviction defense. We built a women's shelter that was a temporary one that is now a permanent one. We built multiple free schools for uh, kids and for adults. We had free tool programs, we gutted houses. We did food security in the name of uh, community gardens. You know, a lot of communities, even outside of disaster, don't have access to clean uh, water and good food. Um, and so we help people to build them in their houses and also in the communities to either build them or to rebuild them. Not just as a thing for community, but also food security. Why not have your own control of your own food? Because uh, um, we did uh, community defense, aid distribution, cop watch. You guys are familiar with cop watch? Um, did a lot of that. We were, uh, broke a lot of stories. We had a lot of media teams come through. Broke a lot of stories of, of police corruption. Uh, Camp Greyhound, which was a, a temporary uh, jail facility. Um, we did civil disobedience and food not bombs. And these are just some of the basic things. And any given week, we could have 100 or 150 pro projects and programs going on at the same time. And it wasn't just me. I was only there for about the first two and a half months and then I became a ghost in the machine and basically what I did was I worked from afar and I just kept coming back because I had to try to rebuild my other life and I had post-traumatic stress so bad. Also, I was under investigation by the FBI and the ATF at that time. 
Um, but there's a, lot, a bunch of other people who had a lot of influence who were very key organizers who um, uh, went on to do things. Lisa Fithian is one, uh, one person that people may or may not know. She was one of the key people at Occupy Wall Street. And all of these people were, uh, were key organizers. Sunset Shakur is a man who actually was a black man not from New Orleans who took up guns against white militia who um, took great risk to do that. Um, and also was a great community organizer who I haven't seen since 2007 and I will see him in Cleveland tomorrow night uh, for the first time. Suffers, and all of us suffer from post-traumatic stress really bad. Uh, from all the violence that was there. And like everything, like all good things, it came to an end in the way that we knew it. The anarchist heyday was over, and in 2008, we became a traditional nonprofit. Less radicals and activists were coming, uh, much more just uh, regular people who just wanted to help were showing up. The, 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 the nonprofit mechanisms were really kicking in. Um, and so we shifted from emergency relief and stuff. This is three years into it. Emergency relief was still happening to like long-term rebuilding. Um, I actually came on the board of, of, of Common Ground for a while to help the transition uh, before finally leaving. And Common Ground still exists today. It's just a lot smaller. And they do a lot of house building. They do uh, community projects, uh, uh, teaching people how to use tools to build worker co-ops. Uh, they do legal defense. Uh, we lost a volunteer named Meg Perry um, to a, a bus accident early on. And one of the, one of the things, that she was a 22-year-old 20, woman who had done a lot of work in, in New Orleans and um, uh, due to a bus accident uh, uh, died. And um, we, there's a project in her name um, to teach for people to do food security because that's what she was working on a lot. Um, and it still exists. And that house that you saw that was underwater is Common Ground's headquarters now. And it's in the middle of the Lower Ninth Ward. And um, the houses around it, we also helped build. This is a hurricane-proof house with solar panels on it. It has rainwater catchment of, I think, 15,000 gallons. Um, it has power generators. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a hub for the community. And instead of a lot of white outside organizers coming and other people from other places, Common Ground is largely organized by people from those communities now, which is what we always wanted. We just didn't know how long it was going to take. And it's just at a slower pace, and it's not in conflict with the government always, or the state, but it still, it still serves a, a fine purpose. And so the question I had, I've been having to ask for years is, well, how do we create these things in the long, slow history of disaster that happens on us? We're all victims of capitalism at different degrees. Even if we are beneficiaries, mostly, it's destroying us, our communities, and the natural world. And so how do we begin to build these things? And this is an open-ended question. It's not like a trick. Uh, because I don't, I don't have the answers, but I think that we have some signposts that lead us that way. And I think that anarchy is a, is an, is a, is a set of ideas, as a, as, a, and as a political framework, provides signposts, not the answer, but ways that we might want to engage. And Common Ground ended up having a huge influence beyond itself that we couldn't have even seen. One, I never imagined the organization was ever going to become what it became. I can t I, I'm not going to lie. I mean, even when I do the, did the diagrams and drew all the networks and all the things I thought we could do, I, it, it became much bigger than I ever thought it was. I didn't know it was going to have that much influence, but 38,000 people coming through. And so, and the, the next disaster that we had, which was the financial crisis in 2008, which is also a man-made disaster, um, people started to organize. Um, in Haiti, Common Grounders became first responders. Um, I mentioned Sean Penn earlier. He had come twice to Common Ground to see what we were doing. And when he went to Haiti, he used the models of Common Ground, except for the conflict part, uh, to build his own autonomous camps and do things outside of the regular channels because he, he saw the importance of it. Um, so that was there. And then the economic collapse happened. And then this thing called Occupy happened, right? Mm -hmm. Common Grounders were incredibly influential on in that. And, 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 and then what happened after that was Hurricane Sandy. And Common Grounders were key to that. And now it's become this thing. Because what I've what I, what I slowly realized, because sometimes I'm a slow learner about things. Did I mention that? Um, is that disasters like these reveal at its core the failures of the state. Not just in response. But overall, because all of a sudden, when, when it's a level playing field, you see how terrible things are, how th terrible things are under capitalism and how terrible things are under the state that we, that, that we have. And so, um, so how do we do that when it's not an emergency? When it's, and that's the question I've been trying to wrestle with. And, there, and being an activist all these years since 1985, uh, both inside and outside the system, you know, I've, I've voted, I've petitioned, I've been arrested numerous times. Um, I've taken up arms against the state, I guess you could say. Um, 
I've done a bunch of things, and there's costs and there's consequences to these things. And one of these was I was labeled as a domestic terrorist. Uh, in 2006, um, I was unceremoniously kicked off the, the, the visiting list of Herman Wallace of the Angola Three after visiting him in prison for five years, which was very difficult to do. It's about 13 hours from my house, um, and, but it was worth visiting. And the letter said, due to information received from outside law enforcement, and then in, in that, the, the Angola Three lawyer contacted um, the, the Bureau of Prisons and they found out that I was listed as a domestic terrorist, an animal rights extremist, and an environmental terrorist. <laughs> Just like some other people in this room. <laughs> and, uh, and it started this Kafka-esque turn of things between 2006, uh, after 2006, where there had already been people sit, sitting out in front of my house, not imaginarily like, oh, I think somebody's there. No, they were sitting in front of my house. It was sheriff department one day, it'd be UT police the next day, it would be unmarked cars the next day, like daily they were there. And, um, and it led me down this thing. And then in 2008, two friends of mine were arrested at the Republican National Convention in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they were charged with terrorism crimes for building Molotov cocktails. And there was an informant amongst them, and that man was Brandon Darby. <laughs> He had, turned, he had turned into an informant and a provocateur, and, and, and even though he didn't lead the crime, he set, up the, he set them up in the whole atmosphere of the, of the thing to, to commit this crime. And they changed their mind and didn't want to do it. They didn't want to, they didn't want to throw the Molotovs. And property destruction, I have no problem with whatsoever. I want to be clear about that. Um, but they didn't know that he was going to be an informant. And so this man, Brandon Darby, had also tried to get me to burn down a bookstore in 2006 of this right, uh, right libertarian bookstore in Austin, Texas. Had I burned down that bookstore, I would have been serving 25 to, I don't know, 50 years is what it is now, Ar arson with political intent. And um, I, all this stuff has started happening. So I had post-traumatic stress. Also during this time, the, the governor's mansion in, in Texas had burned, and I lived 10 blocks from that. And guess how it burned? Somebody threw a Molotov cocktail at the front door and it burned down, $22 million worth of it. So at all during this, the ATF is threatening to kick my door in because I own guns. The FBI is trying to question me and the, 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 the fools called the Texas Rangers are, try, are visiting me at my work and at my home uh, and accusing me of, of burning down the governor's mansion. I was out of my head uh, with everything. I slept with, when I got back from New Orleans, I slept with a 45 under my pillow because it was the last desperate act I was going to take. It was they were going to kick the door, and if they were going to kill me, I was going to shoot back. I'm not saying it was rational. I'm not saying it was reasonable. But it was the only thing that I felt that I could do at that time. I don't feel that way today. I've got counseling. I've gotten a lot of help, a lot of support. But it was very serious. But the war, the war on terror was really a war on us. And if you're going to have a war on terror, you've got to create paper tigers. Um, and you know what paper tigers are? The things that seem scary, but they're not really. And if you're gonna have a war on terror, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to create some paper tigers. So who are the targets of uh, current domestic terrorism? Mostly it's, I wanna, I, I'm not gonna go into a big thing about terrorism, but I, wanna, I want y'all to take this home. It's largely Muslim people, Muslim communities, people of Middle Eastern descent, Middle uh, and Eastern European descent that they think are Muslim, uh, Persian, in, uh, South Asian, Indian, anybody they think is Muslim is 98 or 99% of these cases. The next group that they went after was animal rights and environmental groups. And then the last one was um, political activists in general, but anarchists in particular. And the reason that, that they came after me, I truly believe, is not because I was a badass person, but because I fit the profiles of what they were doing. And that I justified their budgets. So for the billions of dollars that they were getting, they needed people like me. They needed to capture people like me and other people in this room who, can I out you? And like, like Leslie, and other, and other friends of ours who end up going to prison for basically property destruction. And it was, it was and definitely corporations were behind it, and part of it, and the government agencies. Nonviolent activists who had never harmed anybody, never killed anybody, never even threatened to kill anybody, were now public enemy number one. And, and the corporations were definitely behind it because we were fucking with their economic bottom line. And they did not like that. And so we became the domestic top priority. But why would they do this? Well, the number one thing is to maintain power. And the power I'm talking about is a capital P power. Social, cultural, economic, and political power over the rest of us. They want, they is not a secret cabal. They is a system of, of, of you know, they is a system. It's not a secret cabal, but they want to maintain that power. Why? Because of money. 
It's really about this corrupt economic systems that we are under, and they want to maintain power by keep and, and maintain their money. But the biggest piece, and I think the most important piece, is fear, social control. If we are afraid, we will not do anything. If we are afraid, we will, we will do little and ask for little. If we are afraid, they have already won. And so social control is powerful. And the more unknown social control is, and the less we know about it, the more afraid we will be. But I would challenge us not to be afraid. I just told you some, some harrowing stories that are true, that happen to people. Um, but the thing is, I still love people. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I still love the natural world. I still want non-human animals to stop being exploited. I want political prisoners to be free. I want the abolition of prisons. I want the abolition of capitalism. These are all of these things that they have thrown at people like me. We're still here. We're still fighting. We still are dreaming and we're still loving. But if we, we start to fear, we will start distrusting each other. And our bonds of love and, and compassion and passion are much stronger than anything that they can throw at us. And I think that that's important to remember. I'm not saying don't be afraid in your day-to-day lives because it's terrifying when they raid your house. It's terrifying when your friends are going to prison on, on pretext. It's terrifying when they're threatening to kill you. But, and, and, and that doesn't have to happen. But we're a small percentage of people that that's happened to. And they want to make examples of people like us. And, you know, I've still, all during the time I had post-traumatic stress, um, I didn't lay down and, and go and die. I, I, I wrote a book. Um, I uh, talked to people. I did a, a Freedom of Information Act request um, through this, this nonprofit organization. And I was able to find out that they had been, I'd been under investigation as a domestic terrorist for 10 years, starting in 1999, uh, up until 2008, so it was at nine years. And uh, um, that they had... Brandon Darby had turned out to be the fifth informant in my life. Um, and he was the second person who tried to get me to commit a crime that would have put me in prison for the rest of, uh, for the rest of my life, 25 to 50 years. Um, and um, that they had tapped my phones, my internet, they had put closed circuit television across from two different houses that I lived in uh, over the time. Um, they had been in front of my house for years. Um, I could not fly. Between two, uh, I stopped flying in 2006 until 2011 because it was too difficult to get on a plane without being interrogated. And then I was interrogated again once I flew into Canada. That was interesting, which I may never go back to Canada again. But um, it started to make sense. Like, it started to put the pieces in. And um, they were really interested in, in trying to shut not myself, only myself, but other people and other organizations down. And it was, it was revealed in my documents, which are heavy, heavily redacted. But all this, I still organized. Um, and then the last piece, which I think is important, that's why it's the last one, is fight to win. Stop asking for crumbs. We need to ask, we not need to ask, we need to demand more. And you know, the analogy we always hear about is bread and bakeries. Well, think about this. What we're asking for now, I promise you, as political movements, all we are asking for is, a loaf, is not even a loaf. We just want a piece of bread, and all they're giving us is crumbs. We are losing all the way around. Capital is consolidating. Power is consolidating. Luckily, it will end at some point. But today, it's, they, they have it. So we're asking for this, and we're getting crumbs. So what I'm saying is not ask for a loaf of bread or a piece of bread. Demand the damn bakery. Woo! And if they don't, if we, if, they, if we can't take the bakery, then we create our own. And we do that over and over again. Fight to win. Not in a power struggle over and under, but building our power from below. And I think that that is an important distinction to make. So, in closing, I'll say, we need to figure out what we are for and begin to start making long-term strategies for that. These are not plans. This is not like a communist five-year, 10-year, 15-year plans. But instead of being firefighters trying to put out everything, which is what we do, right? How many people go to rally after rally after rally, protest after protest after protest? I've been there. I, I've been there. But what I would challenge us is to stop doing that. Because every war that we protest, we're never going to get off that treadmill until we stop all wars. And I'm not just talking about international wars. I'm talking about wars on women, war on, war on the poor, any wars that are happening. We will not stop them until we systemically change the things that are happening. And part of that, I think, is to start to create something better. If we want 
people to leave the capitalist system, that we must show them something different, something better. And to start with that, we have to start dreaming what that is. And I'm not saying that we impose it on everybody because they can do what they're going to do, but we must, as communities and individuals, at least start to ask those questions and start to make make long-term strategies beyond capitalism, beyond power like I've talked about before, and beyond civilization. I love y'all, and I love this, uh, the places that we have, but we're living on borrowed time in some ways. We're living an, on a house of cards that are unsustainable due to cheap oil and cheap water. Two things that are gonna become scarce in the future. Climate change is real. I'm not an apocalyptic person. I don't dream about the end of the world at all. I don't even, I actually have a lot of concerns about it. But I think that we need to think beyond civilization as we know it and start to reimagine ourselves and our communities and how we organize in doing that. And I would say move from a politics of opposition, which is what we're in as firefighters, to the politics of possibility, which is open-ended and non-deterministic. It doesn't say one, two, three steps, revolution, it's done, we can go home, but it says, what is the future, or what are our futures, and how are we going to get there? And then what's going to happen once we start to move there? And then I remember I talked about earlier dual power. In our actions, every action we take should have dual power. It should resist exploitation and oppression on one hand, but it should also create on the other hand and challenge us to create further on the other hand. If it doesn't do that, do not do it because you're wasting your time. You're wasting everybody's time. And what we have, very limited resources, time, money, and people. We're always underfunded, always short-staffed. And so think about dual power for everything that we build and everything that we do. And then remember this. What I'm talking about is not a plan. It's a set of ideas and that we're going to experiment together. I look to the Zapatistas. The Zapatistas have an open-ended revolution going. They don't know what the end is or if there is an end, but they're willing to try these ideas. And so they're building the road by walking. And I would encourage us to begin to do that. We will try these things for a while. If it doesn't work out, we'll start to do this based on these dreams of the future that we want. And don't be afraid, like I mentioned earlier. The reason I put it back in there is because I cannot... I can't emphasize it enough because so often in our political communities we're afraid of the state, we're worried about surveillance, we're worried about informants. Stop worrying about it and just focus on what we're doing because if we keep our eyes on the prizes that we want, it doesn't matter what they do. All of us will not make it to the, to the promised land and that's okay. But if there's enough of us heading towards those directions and we stay focused, it won't matter what the state does. And I think one of the things for anybody just who's been around for a long time is that we need to learn to be kind to ourselves. Let's stop backbiting. Uh, let's stop fighting with each other. Let's stop wagging our fingers at each other. Let's stop circling up the firing squads. But also, be kind to ourselves. You know, if I can't make the protest, if I can't make the thing, I don't need to flog myself about it. You, each of us can do what we can do, and let's be kind to ourselves, because then we'll stay in, because we want to, because we love it, right? Because our hearts are open. And um, the last thing is, if you're going to be in for a long time, keep it sustainable. If you are burning out, stop doing it. If you see somebody burning out, encourage them to step back and take a break and, and support each other. Because we're here because we love each other, because we love higher ideas, because we want better futures for everybody. And we're not going to do that if we're all tired, if we're all overworked, if we're all completely burned out. So don't give in, don't give up, resist, rebel, create, and build. It's our futures. Thank you.